I'm going to introduce our panelists briefly. And again, just a reminder that all of their extensive bios can be found on our website. Um, the first panelist I'm going to introduce is Gauri Radman. Gauri is right there waving. She is the Vice President of Real Estate Strategy and Development at Direct Supply Aptura, an innovative firm that supports senior living renovation, construction, and new development projects from start to finish. She was previously VP of Design and Construction at Ergens, an assistant professor at MSOE, and co-owner of Coach House Development Partners. She works with a cross-functional team to continually innovate and deliver Aptura's strategic planning, development management, and design build services to their clients. Welcome, Gari. Our next panelist is Melissa Allen, two down from Gari. She is president of Morris Development Group. Melissa is a real estate developer, mother, adjunct professor, and licensed professional counselor. Her passion is at the intersection of social impact and business. In 2006, she founded Mora's Development Group, a real estate development firm that has contributed more than $100 million of investment in the city of Milwaukee. The firm was established on the principle of leveraging bricks and mortar to lift the pride and hope found in the community. Next, Candace Spears. Right here. Candace is a self described serial entrepreneur, wife, mom of three with a portfolio of companies within what is called Floor 23 Group. Floor 23 Digital offers software and software services for crowdsourced challenges and contests. Melora, did I say that right? My Laura, My Laura Property Group acquires, manages, and maintains real estate. Floor 23 Media Group is a media and publishing company with a portfolio of websites, including its flagship website, blackwomangreat.com. Floor 23 Care focuses on residential living and community for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And next is Lissa. Lissa Olker. Lissa is a design principal at HGA Architects. Lissa believes design can empower and transform. She leverages a deep portfolio of transformational projects across community and corporate markets. Lissa is a founding member of HGA's Community Action Program, whose pro and low bono design and volunteer services make communities and businesses stronger. Her approach is to, for each project is to approach each project with empathy and curiosity, engaging diverse stakeholders to develop a solution that reflects the needs of the users. And finally, our moderator. <laughs> our moderator this morning is Portia Young, Director of Corporate Public Affair, Public Relations at Sargento a family-owned $1 billion company based in Plymouth, Wisconsin. In this role, Portia has helped build the company's external president, presence and reputation through developing a media relations strategy, executive visibility, and compelling storytelling. Prior to her role in public relations and corporate communications, Portia worked in broadcast news for more than 14 years as an anchor and reporter at three different ABC affiliates. Her longest tenure was with our media partner, WISN-TV, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So please welcome Portia. Okay, good morning, Brookfield. I am so happy to see all of you this morning. I, um, I faked being a morning person for 10 years, so. Uh, <laughs> But I'm just so honored. I mean, the stories that we've already heard today, Peggy Troy is one of my personal heroes. I have the privilege and honor of serving as the, on the foundation board of Children's Wisconsin, and I am one of those grateful parents that has received world-class care for my little girl at Children's Wisconsin. So 
Big ups to Peggy. I am so, so happy that she has earned this recognition, but I am so thrilled to be with all of these wonderful women on this panel. We got a chance to meet, and I just am blown away by each and every one of your stories. And we are talking today about seizing the moment. How many of you in this room, by show of hands, have had to pivot? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Women, we know what it is to pivot. We pivot five times a day, 24 seven, and I believe that's why we're all here today. So I just wanna first start by asking all of you just in five words or less if you are able to do this okay five words or less how have you seized your moment i'll start with you melissa oh yes i'm gonna start i'm gonna start your closest Didn't know and you that got was the, coming the flyest <laughs> outfit on right now too i want to say <laughs> hey uh five words or less yeah uh how did i seize my moment um waking up waking up every day <laughs> <laughs> and grace. Okay. <laughs> I'll Let's say more later, yeah. but yeah. Um, I would say uh, I stopped being afraid. Ooh, okay. Gallery. I went to my center and recognized it and acknowledged it. Okay. And Candace? I would say seeing an opportunity, learning as fast as I can, and executing, even though I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> that is, what did Dr. King say? You know, faith is taking that first step even when you can't see the staircase. That's what this is about, seizing the moment. So I just want to ask you, Melissa, since we're here, how did that work out for you? And we'll go down the panel. How did that work out? I think it is an evolution. Um, and so life is beyond career, of course because career is not the only thing, should not be the only thing that defines who we are. You heard a little bit about my bio, and I'd say the more that we can integrate who we are into career, I believe that that um, is an important trait. I like Jenny's dad's phrase when it's like, every day is a work day. Uh, I too am an entrepreneur, um, and so every day literally can be a work day, but I also enjoy what I do. That doesn't mean it's easy and I always like it. Um, but I have four degrees, two bachelors, two masters, um, and all of them are different elements of who I am. So I have a broadcasting degree, I have a criminology degree, I have a business degree, I have a psychology degree. I know, it's too much. <laughs> <laughs> but some of, some of that seizing the moment is, you know, who we are is ever evolving. And sometimes we do things opportunistically because we think it's what we should be doing. And sometimes we pause and think about what is it truly that I resonate, resonate with uh, and I use that to build who I am. So um, seizing the moment is definitely an evolving thing, um, but I, I do think it has played out okay. Overall, I'm pretty at ease and chill and get better with time. And so I feel like I'm in a good place. All right, Lissa. Um, so I mentioned fear. I think most people would assume that's kind of uh, fear of failure, but it really was more a fear of being told no. Mm -hmm. So I looked at our profession. I, I'm an architect. Um, I looked at our profession and saw that the folks that I thought should be served by design weren't being served or weren't being served in the right way. We were coming into communities and bringing our own ideas and imposing them versus asking the community what they needed. Mm -hmm. So my fear was around, well, I see a different way of doing this. Um, if I go forward and try it and I'm told no, that was a disappointment I wasn't ready to take because I had so much passion for it. So once I kind of realized that there was no prescriptive path I could make my own, um, I started looking at different processes, different initiatives, different ways to work internally, externally, um, created some strategies around engagement for stakeholders, um, mentorship in that arena, and just started to, to say, I'm not gonna follow the standard path. Um, and turns out that's allowed. Right. Um, and that's uh, really kind of how I've built my success is stepping outside the boundary a little bit. Awesome, gallery. So for me, um, I've had a lot of transitions in my life. I'm originally from Sri Lanka and here I'm hopping around Wisconsin, right? <laughs> I'm raising hockey playing boys, which is kind of <laughs> um, And life throws curveballs and there's very little at, at some point or other, we 
can't control how people respond to us. So what I realized is I really had to lean into myself and have a sense of conviction about my values and how I'm going to move through life. And when I did that, I could manage how I navigate through life. And I think we, it was really well said in the idea that we're not just about our profession. We're about our families. We're about our children. We're about what we give back to the community, how we mentor other women and bring them up along with us. You can do all of that when you're coming from a place of self-confidence and awareness of yourself. And we're constantly growing, and we mm -hmm. should be. I love your four degrees, right? I've got three to go. I think I got another one to come in. Um, <laughs> but it's like keep learning, keep going after the things that seem like the biggest leap of fear, like the, am I going to fail? Am I going to be told no? doesn't matter because if you look inwards and you kind of tie into yourself, we can do anything. Mm -hmm. we, as women particularly, because we're so, from the day we're born, we take on so many things. We're caregivers, we're the daughters. Um, I work in senior living, 53-year-old adult child, that your responsibility, that's who senior living communities sell to, is they're the ones helping parents, right? So in every phase of our lives, we're balancing all of these things, and we're not one thing. We dare not put a woman in a box, right? Like, mm -hmm. we're way beyond that. So, but for us as human beings, as individuals, we have to know ourselves, our values, what drives success for us, what success looks like, how we help other people do things. So. Self-awareness, keep working on that. Yeah. And Candace. So I'm having all sorts of like hallelujah moments over here <laughs> as they're talking. Praise, amen. So much so that when it comes to my turn, I'm about to go off on a tangent. So Portia, can you repeat the question so yes. I stay on task? <laughs> so you seized your moment, you did your five words or less. To those five words or less, how did that work out for you? Ah, so uh, for me, so I'm a serial entrepreneur and Hearing, like hearing what Melissa was saying about, hey, I got criminology, I got psychology. Well, I'm not heavy on the education, but when you look at the things that I'm doing or have actively done, there's so many different facets of us, right? And so for me, that seizing the moment, whenever I see something, I'm a, I'm a strong woman of faith, so I believe that God has me here and everybody here for a reason, for a purpose, and there's something that we have to do. And so whenever I'm feeling that sort of call or this opportunity that pops in front of me, I'm like, okay, so wait a second. Do I need to get involved with this guy? Because I got this going on, this going on. Is this something? And oftentimes is that something that I don't know anything about, like very seriously. And it becomes very intense learning. Mm -hmm. And it's just spending time, isolation, whether it's YouTube, whether it's finding people, learning, 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 and then doing, 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 because that's the only way you get better. So for me, um, I, I think it's, it's worked out well. It's kind of the only way that I know how to get through things. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I'm trying to introduce to my children as well. It's like, oh, you don't know how to do this? Quick story. So my children, who also had locks like me, two of them, I have three girls, two of them decided, okay, it's time for us to cut us. You know, we, we want to go see our hair and not do locks anymore. I said, okay, great. When you do that, just know that I will not be the person that's going to be taking you to your shop appointments and doing all these other things because I had your hair locked for a reason. And so they decided, okay, well, we'll do it. And so they've been in the midst of this journey of discovering and learning how to do it themselves. And in the midst of doing that, you always go through some stages where you may not look like you want to because you haven't got where you want to go, right? And so they've encountered the, you know, everyone saying, oh, I'll do it for you. I'll do this or I'll do that. And I kept repeating to them, listen, You've got to learn. You can make the choice to do that, but you have to learn. Immerse yourself to learn for yourself. Then make the decisions on what you want to do, but you need to first learn because that learning and that power is so, it's amazing. It's incredible. Exactly, exactly. So what I'm hearing is it's confronting the fears, doing by learning by doing, um, continuous learning, lifelong learning. That's how we seize the moments. I want to talk about those career inflection points because you don't have four degrees. Probably you didn't, you weren't that eight year old girl saying, I'm going to go get four degrees. <laughs> um, Lisa, you weren't thinking, okay, I'm going to democratize design for everybody. Gallery, you weren't where you thought you were going to be in Candace for sure. You were a serial entrepreneur. So let's talk about when that inflection point came to you in your career and how you seized that moment, how you captured it to do, another, do something else. And I'll start with Candace, since you have the so mic still. <laughs> <laughs> um, so 
uh, for me, I've always been a person that has had ideas, but I grew up in corporate America. Grew up mm -hmm. in GE, GE's leadership programs and all that great stuff. Um, I had a time after a few job changes where my uh, role ended up going away. I had just left another company because I was recruited out and actually went back to GE for the second time. And it was there in that new role that my role was going away. And it was a crushing moment for me because when you have had this sort of uh, corporate career in life at these fancy companies and oh, you do this and you do that, that's a blow to the ego. And so for me, I remember sitting in the parking lot and just crying like, oh my goodness, like, what, what is going on? And it was at that moment that I said, okay, who I am, who Candace Spears is, will always belong to me. And no one will be able to take that away. I proceeded to go back into corporate America, a different company, that type of thing. Uh, found my, you know, my ideas you know, exploding and some of that entrepreneurship kind of happening. And the person, the CIO, that was sponsoring me and really giving me the wings to fly and introduce new things to the company, he was retiring. And I found myself back at that same moment. I wasn't out in a car crying, but it felt like it. Where it's like, okay, well, 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 who am I? It's happening again. And it was at that moment that I decided within a year, I will be on my own. I am going to leave. I am going to do whatever it is I'm supposed to do. Didn't know what it was, but I knew I had a year to figure it out, make sure all the money was together, and fly. And that was the pivotal moment where something I call taking ownership of your time, talent, and identity. That's what happened to me at that moment, and I've been flying ever since. Awesome. Gallery. Um, oof. So um, I'm older than you guys, so the, I have a couple well. of these things. Um, I did turn up in Wisconsin in um, 1990 with two suitcases, a drafting board, and $20 cash in my pocket, because that's what Sri Lanka gave, let my parents send here. And got my undergraduate, my master's in um, architecture urban planning, started my career, got married, had children, and I'm a serial entrepreneur. I, I have no fear of just, because I, I trust myself so much. I, if there's an opportunity and something looks intriguing, I jump after it. So we started our career working at a firm, realized very quickly that this is not going to serve me for what I want to do with my life, started investing in real estate. We're very, my ex-husband now and I were very successful, started our own real estate development company, did sustainable infill kind of entrepreneurial development, and then nine, 2008 turns around simultaneous to the global financial crisis, um, my business partner, my husband going off together, two children struggling. I was like, woof, Gauri, here we are almost back, back at the beginning. I'd come with $20, made millions. Now I need to rely on myself. And I pivoted. And there were a couple really good reasons why I was incredibly successful at pivoting and making sure that I was there present, presenting myself the way I needed to raise, get my two boys off the ground and going. Because that was ultimately my biggest responsibility as a mother, despite all the curveballs simultaneously that were coming at me. There was also a health crisis built into this. Um, and the reason was that throughout my career, even after going through college, I always had a passion for it. I never compromised on anything. Social service was really important to me. Even while having young children, I always volunteered. I was on the Sojourner Board. I was working with Habitat for Humanity, did stuff in organizations that I had a passion for. That also opened the network of people I knew. So I had this amazing tribe around me and mentors around me because I wasn't staying in the lane that I just wanted to. There was that. I also did multiple jobs. I was teaching at MSOE, I was planning consulting, I was doing architecture. I leveraged all of those things. But I, but I also had the courage to completely blow up my business and walk away from it. Start from scratch. Um, completely blew up my marriage and my business because I had to. That was my dignity, what I needed to do for myself. I could do it because I knew I was going to go be able to be successful. And then I went and I said, and then in the middle of all that, I lost my job. So now everything's gone. And I had to sit back, think through. And again, I said, I started off by saying, you have to know yourself and where your values are. I had to raise the kids. I had to make it economically work. And I had to find passion in life, right? And so I very systematically went through to try and where I was going to land. And because I knew myself, I knew what I needed. I was okay being in corporate world, but I need to be in an entrepreneurial corporate world that would let me be me because I'm not willing to turn up anybody else than Gary Rodman. This is who I am. You like me or not, 
and I know what I can do. I found that place. And now my kids are thriving. My boys are 24 and 26. They're self-sustaining. One's at Goldman Sachs. The other one decided to do a math degree and become a chef. I'm like, go for it, guy. Um, <laughs> he's at the Girl and the Goat. I'm driving down there to have dinner tonight and watch my little 24-year-old actually work. And like, hey. And he pays for his own bills. Um, but, but it's like, so I get to laugh and smile and have fun in life because I, I had that courage to pivot. Mm -hmm. But there were lots of things that got me there. Don't forget yourself when all these other things happen to you. Everything that happened to me was stuff that I couldn't really control. All I could control was my response to it. And that strength is what we as women need to know. The other thing I had is an unbelievable tribe of women who called BS on me if I started getting into my pity party. <laughs> you need your girlfriends that can do that for yes. you. Mm -hmm. Call you so, up. Mm -hmm. Call Keep you up you and honest. say, I don't think so. Uh -huh. you, you cry, here, have a bottle of wine, now start. <laughs> okay. And Lissa? Uh, so, so I think my inflection points are less pivots and more hurdles. So mm. I knew I wanted to be an architect since I was about 14. Mm. So we'll say roughly 30 years worth of essentially being on a track but hitting barriers and needing to find ways to get over the barriers so that I could keep going towards the goal that I wanted to get to. Um, one, of the main, uh, one, of the, one of the biggest inflection points from that is when I came out of grad school, I had this notion, like, great, I, I got a job at a firm, I'm gonna be a designer, it's gonna be awesome. Um, four years in, I hadn't done anything but technical drawings and I wasn't getting design opportunity. And I was learning a lot. I was learning a lot about the technical side of it, but I felt like I was losing my design acumen. Mm -hmm. um, grad school is all about design. And so um, I talked to a few other um, folks in the same experience, and I said, well, why don't we just make up some hypothetical design opportunities for ourselves? We'll, we'll come up with a hypothetical problem, and we'll solve it. And we'll get together, and we'll get trace people, and we'll have fun. So we did that for a while, and it was a really great opportunity um, to learn about collaboration and everything, but we were just doing these hypothetical projects. And um, one of our principals came to us and said, Riverside High School has, uh, would like to redo their student union. Would you guys be willing to do that as volunteer? And we thought, of course, it's what we're already doing, but now it's a real project. So we did this project, we met with, you know, we met the kids, we worked through it with them, we were you know, getting our hands dirty, we had an opening in there like playing Dance Dance Revolution, and it was, I had this like aha moment of, oh, I can actually use my design and architecture talents to help organizations, communities. I'd come up, I'd been brought up with a very um, sort of uh, volunteer community notion, but I'd never applied it to my job. And it was this aha moment of putting the two things together, and that led to the formation, I was the co-founder of our community action program, which is pro bono services, um, day of service. We just had our 10 year anniversary where um, we donated um, more than 17,000 hours um, and 50 some pro bono projects. Um, so it's a really amazing program, and the reason that that was an inflection point, other than just um, creating something that I am passionate and love, is that got me a lot of recognition in the firm. We have a firm of 1,000 plus people in multiple offices. For someone like me, a lonely young person in the Milwaukee office, to get FaceTime around yeah, entrepreneurial, I just learned today from Jenny, I love that. Um, and I didn't know that's what I was doing, but now I know. Um, that, that really, um, helped my career growth substantially. Um, and then one other quick little anecdote about that, that was how I got my first true design, paid design job, which was Radio Milwaukee. Because we had engaged with Radio Milwaukee through Community Action. Mm -hmm. And so then when that project came up, they said, hey, do you want to be the designer on it as we chase it? And I thought, this is, right, this is all my work coming yeah. together. And the second inflection point was, did Radio Milwaukee, wonderful project, won awards for it, I thought, hey, I have made it. Like the opportunities are just gonna start rolling in. Uh-huh. Right? Ah, nope. Oh yeah. <laughs> crickets. <laughs> Absolutely just crickets. So that inflection point was just an awareness of you are continually having to do the work and to fight and to promote yourself and do all those mm -hmm. things to get it. There's no sitting back. Success does not solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's just a, another inflection point of learning of what's next, what's next, what's next. Continual growth, continual learning. Mm -hmm. Doesn't always happen for women. I'll put it that way, just Very good keeping point. it real. All right, Melissa. I will say life will exhaust you if you let it, too. Yes. This mm -hmm. constant chase is something to also be aware of because you can lose yourself and your mind in that mm -hmm. process. So that's something that I definitely have to bring myself to is I, if I'm too anxious or I'm 
to whatever, like maybe we need to just sit back. Like last night I'm looking at the moon and I'm like, yes, <laughs> harnessing the power of the moon. And so um, taking those moments to also just chill out mm -hmm. is also very much appropriate. And so with every degree that I have is definitely a story that goes along with it. Um, I'm a talker, so that whole say something in five words <laughs> wasn't it for me and I <laughs> need a do over it. <laughs> <Okay>. um, <laughs> so when I when I first went to college um, I thought I was gonna do a broadcasting degree actually well, I still have a broadcasting degree um, and so I would catch the bus every day to Marquette and I would be on the bus stop with this dude who was in law enforcement he was a correctional officer for Milwaukee County He's like, young girl, you need to go get you one of these correctional jobs. <laughs> and I was like, sure, let me go get one of these correctional jobs. And so I applied for um, um, the state of Wisconsin Department of Corrections and the county's uh, Department of Corrections, got offered jobs for both, and then I became a correctional officer for the state of Wisconsin, did that for four years. So I'm still at school at Marquette, um, but then now I'm in this law enforcement field. So I was like, well, how many credits will it take to actually like double major? So that's how I ended up with the criminology and law studies degree. Um, with the broadcasting at the time, I was doing like internships. So I'd be at Summerfest doing like little radio reports at the Milwaukee Brewers doing like little reports. So I ended up um, from my internship, getting a job with the Milwaukee Brewers as their entertainment assistant while I was a correctional officer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, That's just, unique. <laughs> just, you know, serendipitous to a certain extent, but also a part of like going with the flu and mm -hmm. trying things. You never know what's going to come out of it. Um, and from there, that would have been 2004, 2004, yes. Okay, so 2004, then Marquette comes out with this program called ACRE, the Associates in Commercial Real Estate Program, a 25-week non-degree program that taught you real estate, fed you, and it was free, and it was at my alma mater. Um, so I graduated from college 2003. So a couple of years later, then they offered this program. Just on a whim, I applied for it, took it, and this is still wild being a correctional officer, still working for the Brewers, happened to be very pregnant, and was like, well, let me try this real estate class. It's free, it's at my old school, I need something else to do, why not? Took the course, loved it. Like, opened my eyes to a whole nother industry, and I jumped into real estate, so then I had to let something go, because at that point, the plate was not, mm -hmm. it just wasn't happening. Um, and so I had to, I first let go of criminology, because that took too much of my time. Um, the Brewers was more flexible, but um, I started off after that acre program, I became a commercial appraiser, did that internship for a year, then got the opportunity to be mentored in real estate development. Um, started my business in 2006, Moore's Development Group is now 18 and a half years old. Awesome. Yay. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, snap, snap, snap. <laughs> snap, snap, snap. Um, some point early in the real estate development career, I had to let the brewers go because real estate kind of was uh, getting some traction, yada, yada, yada. So as I'm in business, I'm like, I need something that'll make me like stand, stand out. I need something. So that's when I was like, well, let me go get an MBA. And so then I got an MBA from Marquette because I was like, I need some letters behind my name so people can like take me serious. Um, and so that's why I got the MBA. And then uh, in 2017 or so, I was like, well, let me do something that brings me passion. And so that's when I got the, the master's in psychology and I became a licensed professional counselor. All of that to really say, right? Like, I also have an ex-husband, a baby daddy, and a current husband. <laughs> <laughs> a 21-year-old, a 19-year-old, a 9-year-old. So my life is a little bit like, you know, kind of not like, I knew I wanted to be an architect, so I became an architect, and that's my career. Nah, that ain't me, y'all. Um, and so maybe somewhere in between Alyssa style and Melissa style, you'll find your style. Um, but for me, it's always about, like, I don't have to have a limitation. I don't have to show up who you, th who you think I need to be. I can become 
who I desire to be. And that's my choice because guess what? It's my life. And so I get to dictate that. So you get to make the rules, right? I know jobs and society try to create a frame of who you need to be. But actually, no. Like to me, matrix, red or blue peel, like create the reality that you want. It's more than a notion. It's hard to do. But push back against any norm that's trying to determine what your future and what your life should be like. And that is a great place to work from. And it takes work and it can be stressful. But the more you do it, the better you get at it. And then you chart your path the way you desire to have it charted. For me, seizing the moment was about seizing my time. Time is the most precious thing we have on earth. It is more valuable than money. And when I left the news business, I love it, and I'm never going to besmirch it because I knew from a little girl I wanted to be a journalist. My time is now my own. I don't have to live by a clock anymore. I don't have to wake up on Christmas morning and go to work. If I'm not saving lives, I don't need to be there on Christmas morning. So my time is my own. I have control over my time. And that gives you control over your own power. And that's what I'm hearing from all of you. You guys chose to use your time in meaningful ways. And you said, I had to get rid of stuff on my plate because I needed to allocate my time to different things that gave me passion. Can we talk more about this concept of how do we fit it all in and still fill our cups? And I'll, I'll go to Gallery. <laughs> oh, your mic. <laughs> that would be helpful. Sorry, guys. Um, the idea of what fills your cup really comes from the idea of, um, comes from the concept of recognizing the things that bring value to you and feed your soul. So I've made it my mission as I'm going through life to find the things that fill that cup for me. And that's where my focus goes to. And it's, it's a wide variety of things. It may be, it's obviously my children, my family, definitely. Mm -hmm. It's my career and what I do. But it's also the little things. It's being able to go to spend some time in an art museum and look at a beautiful piece of artwork, reading a book that I just absolutely love, going for a walk. But everything that I do, the compromises work in the end. Because I'm a better person if I'm a more relaxed person. Right? If I'm walking through life being, oh, I got to do this for this person and that for that person, mm -hmm. you know what? I'm the only one that can change it. You got to have the courage to change it. And so to me, filling your cup is really around managing time. I think that's perfectly said, but also choosing the things that you fill your time with. Mm -hmm. um, and they, we all have to do mundane stuff. It's life. But fit in those real moments for yourself. Candace, I want to push on a topic with you about mentorship. And we heard um, Ms. Just talked about mentorship and how people kind of, you're standing on other people's shoulders. How do you go about getting a mentor? Everybody uses that word, but, but how do you do that? You know, so I don't believe that mentorship is just a, um, you know, I have to say, hey, Portia, would you mentor me? Right? And have this direct mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. happening. Um, I believe mentorship is, first off, it's, it's, it is literally everywhere. It could be in a book. It could be in a person that you follow. Um, for me personally, I have had um, folks that are informal mentor, mentors. I have some right now. Um, I have folks that I have paid thousands and thousands of dollars to, to be <laughs> mentors and coaches and that type of thing. Um, but I think the first thing that's maybe important to know is, one, it's accessible to everybody. Two, identify where you think you want to go or what you think you need to learn more about to get where you want to go. And then just keeping the field open. Maybe it's a book, maybe it's a podcast, maybe it's a person you want to delve in, find their biography, maybe they're doing an event somewhere or whatever. I think it's easily accessible, but redefine how you think about it because it might ne not necessarily be a, hey, let's go to lunch for 30 minutes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes it is, so making that connection, is that awkward to just come up to somebody you kind of know and invite them to lunch? Like, how does that work? So, so one of the things I would say is, if you are curious, mm -hmm. if you are curious, you will never have to worry about striking up a conversation or building a relationship. So 
if I am anyone who's like, hey, I'm seeking a mentor from this person that's over here, and I don't know how to approach them, I don't know how to network, be curious. Who are you? Don't say it to them like that, though. <laughs> <laughs> but be curious about just understanding what, what, what's, what's bringing you here. Tell me more. Like, oh, I'm fascinated by this or by that. And you will learn because people love to talk about themselves. You will learn that you find some genuine connection that allows you a wedge where you don't even have to ask. It just becomes, hey, let's continue this conversation again. I love chatting with you. And it just goes. Okay, and Gallery, you were going to say yeah, something? I just was going to say one of the things with mentorship, because I think you stated perfectly, is I've turned to people to mentor me who I've been really uncomfortable with. So when I'm in a workplace and there is an individual, man, woman, doesn't matter, but somehow the other, we're like vinegar and oil, this is not working, I've taken the challenge to kind of reach to them from a different angle, because obviously the way we're communicating isn't working, and I have learned so much from them, because different points of view suddenly have this aha moment for you. So sometimes with mentorship, don't lean into the people that are like you, or necessarily, but go to the uncomfortable places, because that's where growth happens. Lisa, how do you encourage teams to kind of seize their moment? Because you've done that, and now you've had to stand up this nonprofit arm of this wonderful organization. How do you encourage others to, to do the same? Um, one way I do that is, is sharing my story. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is a tendency to see a roadblock and try and make a right turn. And sometimes that's the right decision. Um, but by telling my story, I make sure they know that sometimes it's just pushing through. And sometimes that's harder. Um, so telling my story and then just trying to, again, mentor in a way to say, um, talk to me about what your challenge, the challenges that you're having. Let's talk through it. Um, and for me, building the team up is um, trying to help them understand not only how I got to where I am, but what it takes to do the type of work that I do, um, which is somewhat self-serving because I'm trying to build a team that can help me grow impact, but also help us look at all of our projects with a community lens. And a huge part of that is an environment where they want to be present. So I'm in the office every day, five days a week. Um, most of our leadership is, not all of our staff are. The staff who are really dedicated and want to learn and want that mentorship and growth are there because the um, impromptu conversations that you hear. This is how I learned everything I know about architecture. I learned some in school, but I learned by sitting next to people and over here, and you know this, right? Hearing someone talk about a code issue and just listening and learning and saying, hey, can, I know I'm not on that project, but can you explain what, what you just were talking about with the contractor? Um, so trying to, tr maybe answering your question, trying to create a culture where um, folks who want to learn want to be present in the office, in the environment, um, so that they can have that opportunity for informal mentorship. What about those people who don't want to learn, who have tapped out, who just want to come and get that paycheck and go? Um, they will quickly learn that opportunities don't go to them. If I get a call from Melissa calls me and it's like, hey, can you come look at this building? I want your, your input on it. I'll grab someone who's in the office to come with me. If you're at home, I'm not going to team you and say, hey, do you want to maybe come and meet me there later? Right? So they're going to learn pretty quickly that they're not getting the opportunities that the people who are present are. Melissa, on that note, company cultures and purpose and all that, you feel like, I feel like you have your own personal purpose statement. Um, you do many things. I wanted to talk to you about the mental health aspect of your, of your role and what you're seeing today and how we can combat the vices that we have, the phones that, that make us you know, more lonely and, and, and anxious. Can you talk about how that comes into play in hindering or maybe people seizing your moment? Because you do work at Rogers, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so all right, y'all probably have not kept track of what I do <laughs> for a living. Um, so let me level set for that for like 30 okay. seconds. So the core of what I do is real estate development. I've been a real estate de developer for 18 and a half years. So what does that mean? I'm not a broker. I'm not going to help you buy and sell a home. That's not what I do. What I do is I manifest, manifest real estate transactions. And for me, what that has played out to is um, doing deals in urban Milwaukee that are either new construction or rehab. And so my portfolio is something over 
400 apartment units with um, several thousand of commercial real, um, commercial retail type spaces. When I do real estate therapy work, it is definitely a part-time thing, but it also is something that I do with intention and passion. And I do it because I do think that it is important to hold space for people who are going through things, who may need some support or whatever. The track that I ended up on in the therapy space is um, my initial internship was through Aurora's uh, Healing Center. So I worked with adult survivors of childhood and adult sexual assault. Um, once I graduated in 2019, I took a position at Children's Hospital. Again, therapy is part-time, um, real estate is full-time, and where I actually make um, my livelihood. Um, notwithstanding, so I worked for the Children's Hospital for four years, actually up until this year, as an outpatient therapist. So my clients were people from ages 6 to 18, Children do not exist without their caregivers, so as a part of that support of young folks came also, comes also their caregivers. Um, I stopped doing outpatient therapy with children's probably around um, March and began with Rogers because I wanted to learn more about the intensive outpatient um, partial hospitalization program and even the inpatient types of therapy modalities still with a primary focus on youth, but then also uh, I work with adults too. All of that to say, no matter if we're a professional in this space, um, we still can have stuff, some that are like chemically imbalanced within us, some that are society, some that are relationships, some is childhood, some that is generational. Uh, I think Portia's specific question for me was around uh, electronics and digital stuff. I will defer you to Google, which is an electronic resource <laughs> that can help you find more information on it because I'm not a specialist in it, but practically speaking, right? If we're on our phone, we're probably not paying attention to what is around us. Um, I'm not perfect. I could even be in the car and on the phone, which is probably not the best, so it can, can become distracting. We, of course, can use technology uh, in a good and positive way, but we have to be smart and responsible for it. So when you read about the impact of technology on life, you'll read about anxiety, you'll read about increased incidences of ADHD, um, exposures to information that maybe we probably shouldn't be exposed to, whether it's a child or an adult, uh, and just know that the resources are out there um, for you. So that's how I answer that question. And to be more present in your life. Oh, because sure. you said you were looking at the moon last night. So. Oh, 1,000 <laughs> percent. Like, okay, I wasn't doing that. <laughs> oh, yeah. This moon isn't coming back for 13 years, so oh. you missed it if you it's didn't see it. a special one? Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, I know we're probably running low on time. Here, you four do, I think we, let's see, do we get any questions from Arthur? Let's see. If you have any questions, please text them to that number that was on the screen. Um, but I want to just say we're going to kind of, close and wrap up with the one thing that we have. And you saw in your programs, there's some fun one things that have just been pulled anecdotally from some of the uh, breakout session panelists, but also I wanna go with Candace. What is, your, what is your one thing, if you want everybody to just kind of take away as we close the seizure moment panel? Um, the one thing I would say is take some time to understand who you are, mm -hmm. unrestricted. Who you are, without any other expectations about who you should be, who other people think you are. And just take some time to understand what is that purpose, what is that impact that you want to leave. I think more than anything, because we are in a world where we are busy, right? I don't necessarily celebrate that term. So because we're in a world where we are busy, mothers, wives, aunts, you name it, coworkers, leaders, executives, managers, individual contributors, entrepreneurs, whatever it is, it's so easy for us to have our identity be wrapped up in the doing and the routine and the staying on track to keep our sanity. So my one thing is just understand who you are unrestricted, get some silence, get some peace, and then make a plan to go after that. Awesome. Gallery? Um, for me, it is 
Look in the mirror and see yourself and know how unbelievably amazing you are, every one of us, man, woman, child. There is so much of who we are that we are very shy about. We, we don't want to project that. We feel we have to accommodate ourselves to fit into the environments we are. Take the courage to believe in yourself. Take the courage to look at yourself, understand yourself, because then the impact and the footprint you live on the world, leave on the world is yours. Not something that somebody else told you, what your grandmother said you should do, or what you said you had to learn. It's what you want. And we can only do that if you know yourself. So one of the things I realized in life is, is that I was going through life with autopilot. Like, oldest daughter, had to do this, get, I'm Asian, had to get an education. Like, then I had to get married, have my children, and I've suddenly like, lost myself along the way. Not that any of those things didn't matter. They were all also important to me but I needed to own them for myself. So really spend the time, it's the most valuable time you'll spend, really looking in for yourself. It's okay, when you're comfortable with yourself, you're perfect for the world. When you're not comfortable, you're standing on quick stand. You can't be, you can't be a good mother, a good coworker, a good volunteer, a good citizen, unless you have that. So it's okay to do that, it seems really selfish, but it makes you a better person. And you do that one thing every morning, you say? I do. What do you do? I spend, so I do, I also looked at the moon. I have pictures of the moon. It's the, I, sunrises and moon, the, it makes me realize that the world is a heck of a lot bigger than me and just absolutely beautiful. But now I have the luxury because my kids are gone and I don't have to pay any bills for them. Um, that I get up in the morning and I literally give myself time to center myself and get ready for the day. I play computer games, I play Sudoku with my 89 year old mother in Sri Lanka and she kicks my butt still. <laughs> but it's my time to center and my time to kind of reframe how I'm gonna approach the world. I go out much better. I'm, it's a combination of meditation, playing some of these mind games because this mind better work for a while. Um, it's it, give me myself time. I never did that. I was always felt guilty to do that. Like heaven forbid, I'm going to take 20 minutes, and now I can take an hour. Like, but even if it's five minutes, give yourself that time. We deserve it. Mm -hmm. Lisa, what's your one thing? Um, my one thing is be curious and ask questions. Mm -hmm. So early in my career, I, I felt like I had to pretend I knew everything. And so I would just pretend I knew stuff and then I'd get back to the office and I'd be like, oh, I don't know what to do now because I didn't ask any questions. Um, and I realized it's okay to not know everything. I work with dozens of different types of clients and I don't know exactly how a distillery works or how motorcycles get built or, you know, there are all these fascinating clients that I work with and I've learned to just be curious and ask them tons of questions. And one of the things that that does is it means that in my job, I get to do stuff that's super, super fun. Right? Like I learn about stuff that's interesting. And it took that pivot of, oh, it's okay to not know everything about motorcycles. Yeah. I've never ridden a motorcycle before, okay. what do I know? So um, be curious, it's okay. And you're gonna learn something that um, may impact your job, may impact your life, may impact a funny story, you, anecdote you tell someone interesting that you meet later on. Um, so that's my one thing. And that's how you seize your moment, being curious. Yep. Okay, and Melissa, finally with you, what's your one thing? Yeah, I would say use everything that life gives to you, no matter what it is, if it's defined as good or bad. And the example that I want to give with respect to that is my nine-year-old daughter, Evelyn, was born with a blood disorder, um, very high-functioning <clears throat> human, but she does have a special medical need that can deter life at any point. So her condition is called sickle cell anemia, um, and she, when she was seven months old, she had her first blood transfusion and probably has had 23 wow. over her lifetime, right? So you can, I could, I could, could have taken that moment, any phase of her life, because it's, it's always going to be something, just the nature of the condition. But I can take that and I can have a pity party. Um, she could take it and have a life that's full of like pity. But that's not the choice that we're choosing. We're choosing to say, you know, you have a condition, but you are not the condition. And so when we're in the moment, we'll be in that moment. When we're out of that moment, we're gonna like, you know, be free and live life fully. So one of the things also related to the blood donations, I had no idea like when somebody needs blood, where they get it from. And the doctor was just like, uh, from people who just like give it. And I'm like, so somebody just goes to a clinic and gives their blood freely. 
Yes, otherwise a lot of people would be dead, including Evelyn, and so harsh, but it's true. And so all of that to say, as you probably heard from my story and the themes, is I'm not just taking the good fluffy, the successes, and making life life. I'm taking all of this, can I curse? Shit. <laughs> um, you gotta go with the ebbs and the flows of it, and you gotta ride that wave, and that is how you have a full life. It's not because, ooh, Jenny look cute, she got a nice outfit, she a billionaire. Mm. No, it's like, we gotta like ride this wave, and I think poker is a great analogy because I don't know what cards you're being dealt. I know what cards I'm being dealt, and I'm gonna work that hand to the best of my ability. Mm -hmm. And so that's my one thing to you all as we close this morning. Awesome, well thank you. And I'll just share my one thing was very trivial, but every night I have thin Oreo, Oreo thins and a little peanut butter on top. <laughs> Oreo thins, not the big, big Oreos, but thank you very much. I hope all of you will seize your moment. Thank you to Melissa, Alyssa, Gallery, Candace. Thank you for enlightening us this morning.